It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm most grateful to all of you for coming. <laughs> Without an audience, you're nothing. So, <laughs> so, uh, so uh, this afternoon, I'd like to uh, talk to you about the uh, microscopic solar cell research we have been doing in our laboratory. And uh, just uh, to show you one of those, this is actually a Dyson sized solar cell. Uh, each leaf is one Dyson sized solar cell. And it's, uh, the veins, you see this actually the con collectors for those cells. And the color comes from the dye. Now, now the, the, the green color reminds us that uh, photosynthesis uses a molecule to generate electric charges from light. It's actually the only system that uses a molecular absorber to generate electric charges from light, apart from a Dyson cell solar cell. Dyson cell solar cell mimics photosynthesis. And, and by doing so, it separates the, uh, the light absorption process from the charge carrier transport. In any other PN junction cell, you, you have this, uh, this uh, problem that the same material that absorbs light also conducts the carriers that are produced under illumination. And so there's an accumulation of tasks, and, and that, that makes it more complicated and, and very often more expensive. So we are, we are separating these two functions. And uh, if you illuminate those uh, leaves, actually, I should tell you, this is a Japanese uh, a product, it's being commercialized already in Japan. So what does, what does it do? Well, it's something very modest. The, uh, the uh, butterflies start to flap the wings. And, uh, people find this very attractive and funny. So, so it's not a megawatt power <laughs> plant. Uh, so um, it's just by way of introduction, I want to show you that. And so the problem which we are facing is actually the energy demand going up. I mean, there's no doubt, mainly due to population growth. We have the global warming effect. We have the oil that is peaking, and to top it all off, the pollution. And so, so how do you deal with these challenges? Well, the solution can only be renewable sources. I mean, at the end, we have only renewables left. So, so it's, uh, it's, it's high time to, to think about introducing renewables, the reason being that by year 2050, you're facing an energy gap that is as big as today's consumption. Today's consumption is uh, about 400 exajoules per year. One exajoule is 10 to the power of 18 joules. 400 means four times 10 to the power of, of 20. And the sun gives us about 10,000 times more in terms of joules per year. That's the total area of the world. But uh, it's clear that uh, we need to cover, by year 2050, a gap that is as big as today's consumption. So we need another four times 10 to the power of 20 joules per year. But no, we can't take it from oil that is depleting and causing pollution and global warming. So we need to find carbon-free sources. And so the challenge, then, is to develop carbon-free energy sources that uh, uh, can convert the, uh, for some solar radiation at a uh, competitive cost using abundant materials and without having a high, long energy payback time. There are several, several very difficult targets that have to be met to introduce at large scale on the terawatt scale. We talk about terawatt scale solar power. And so some people think actually that. Uh, it's an intractable problem, and it's already too late, and we need a miracle to happen. But that's not the attitude to take. So we have to, especially the young scientists and young students, they, sh they should focus their attention to these problems. And we need a, a tsunami to bring, move this field forward and, uh, and solve the issues which I just briefly outlined by way of introduction. And so just think about what Thomas Edison said in 1931. He would put his money on the sun and solar energy. If you ask today investors to do that, they, you'll get a very cold shoulder from them. And so, uh, but Thomas Edison, he said he water source of power. 
I hope we don't have to wait until oil and coal run out before we tackle that. That's, that's exactly what we are, the problem we are facing today. So this statement was done 80 years ago. So, so the, uh, we will see a, a progression as time goes on. You see uh, today we are here with about, well, about 500 exajoules. That's the exajoules. And, and a lot of coal and hydrocarbon, but as we move on to say year 2050, you see that the uh, most of the increase is doubling comes from the renewable sources, has to. And so the challenge is to how to meet this target. And PV has been doing well, but uh, still in the gigawatt, we need terawatt, terawatts of power, so the scale is still very small. It's, a thousand times smaller than what we need. And, and it turns out that the silicon uh, market is very sensitive to subsidies. There has been some setbacks and valuations of companies have crumbled. And so the time isn't all that good for photovoltaics at the moment, although the growth has been very significant. And so about 45% per year over the last few years. So uh, for to build uh, the Next generation, we have to keep in mind some, some of those are trivial efficiency, stability. This is a cost figure which is uh, difficult to meet. So today's cells are about six times too expensive. So it's 30 US cents per kilowatt hour instead of five. We need five to be competitive. All this happened, the matters, energy payback time, environmental effects, resources and feedstock. If you want to build a cell out of catelloids, you should be aware that the tellurium is as rare as gold. And so you can't get to the terawatt scale. This can only have a very limited uh, contribution to the global problem we are facing in the next decades. Leave alone the issues from using very toxic materials like cadmium. And so here's the disensitized cells. Uh, I show you. Uh, one embodiment is the, uh, the glass embodiment, which uh, uses two conducting glasses. Uh, it, uses, it looks like a panel, a glass panel, but the, the glass has a uh, conducting transparent oxide coated on the inner surface. And so that makes it very useful because you can use the glass as a con collector. And you see we're having here the ambient light turning a fan so these cells are actually made by Christian printing the, uh, the nanocrystalline film of titania on one of the glasses. And then you, you dip the glass in a solution that has a, the sensitizer in it. And by molecular self-assembly, the dye goes on as a monolayer, self-limited process. And you, you have to conceive and engineer the dye so that it has the right anchoring groups. It will go onto the oxide, and then once you have covered the surface, there's no more anchoring sites, well, the process stops. And so this cell is also a, a so-called bifacial embodiment. It captures light from the back as well as from the front. And that's very important for window, power window applications where you have a lot of diffuse light you want to harvest so here are some of the features you can bring motives. It's also a solar cell from Sony Corporation. Instead of printing this very modest motive, our EPFL logo, the designer made this kind of very beautiful design. It's a photovoltaic converter. And, and I also, I should show you this slide from Juan Bisco, a Spanish colleague, which uh, Again, the transparency. Actually, this cell is the only solar cell that comes in a, a transparent uh, configuration, a look-through look through a system. And that has already been used to make watches. The watch class is powering the watch, and you don't see the dye. It's, uh, the amount is so small, or it has only near-infrared absorption that you don't see the dye. So now let's... Uh, look at the interior of this device. So we have the, the dye, which uh, in the earlier days we used to focus on ruthenium dyes. And this was the N, stands for Dr. Nazarudin, 
one of my co-workers, and three was the third die he made. That's about, well, <laughs> 18 years ago. And uh, so uh, and that's a part of the die, and then we need the mascopic titania film, which is composed of nanoparticles, so about 20, 20 nanometer sized particles. They are applied as a paste, just printed, and then you heat the uh, layer up very briefly, about 400 degrees, and, and it puts the particles in electronic contact, and so then you have a, a network of particles which actually serves as electron conducting, as electron acceptor and as electron conducting matrix. And so, uh, so the role of this uh, film is to support the dye and accept the electrons from the dye after light excitation and conduct the electrons to the charge collector, the front surface. And this is an ionic liquid. It's uh, the methyl propylamidus sodium iodide, which, uh, which uh, usually comes uh, as a, a iodide, triiodide mixture. So here we have iodide and triiodide. Well, that's why this uh, liquid is colored. The triiodide has a, a, a color. And so, the, uh, so this is today's uh, most frequently used electrolyte. It's a, it's a melt. It's liquid down to minus 80 degrees and uh, stable up to plus 300. It doesn't have a vapor pressure. So it's a real very nice uh, system to use as an electrolyte or, or conductor of positive charges. Uh, so this is why today all the industrial made systems use uh, ionic liquids. So, so when we excite the sensitizer, we using the light in the see in the range from 700 down to about 300. This is the absorption spectrum of the N3 dye, and, and the black curve is the solar emission. So this dye is better than the, the trist by pyridyl ruthenium complex, which is uh, here indicated in orange color, but <clears throat> doesn't capture really enough light to be optimal for the voltaic converter. You would need to, to go up to 900 and capture all the photons below 900 and convert them to electric current. But later I show you some uh, recent breakthrough in the sensitizer design where we have actually, today <coughs> we have dyes that go up to almost 1,000 nanometers and capture all the photons and have very high conversion efficiencies. We have a molecular silicon at this stage that has a very similar spectral response to silicon photovoltaic cells. So when you excite the ruthenium dye, the uh, electrons move from the uh, HOMO, this is the frontal orbitals, the HOMO is on the ruthenium thiocyanate, to the LUMO, the LUMO being the pi star orbitals of the bipyridylic, and, and you see the binding goes through those carboxylates. These are the binding groups, the anchoring groups, that will hold the sensitizer onto the titanium surface. And the binding is through coordination it's a bidentate coordination of titanium surface ions. And so, so what you do is you move by an excitation, you move the charge towards the surface, and uh, so the excited state the electron density is, is shifted favorably so that the electrons can interact strongly with the uh, or empty orbitals in the oxide. These are 3 3D orbitals of titanium ions, the conduction band of, of titania. And so we'll see later that's a, that's a design uh, principle very important, to have the optical transition be vectorial, replacing the, the moving the electrons from a side that's away from the surface towards the surface. We'll, we'll see that as a, a recurrent theme in the design of new sensitizers. And so we get about 50 nanoseconds. Well, is that a long? Well, it's much more than what we really need. Because later we will see that the forward injection process, the ones that generate charges in the femtosecond time domain. So that's actually a very long lifetime. And it's plenty to get the uh, first uh, light induced redox reaction going. And so if you think about it, 
Let me just, uh, if you think about the steps that occur under light, so here's our sensitizer, excited. And so that's number one is the light excitation. That's what we just discussed. And num number two is the ejection. So now we have the electron and the, and the titanium nanoparticles. In the conduction band, we're only using the conduction band of those nanoparticles. The valence band is way down. It's 3.2 EV band gap, so we never move any positive charge or holes through the semiconductor. So the semiconductor is an n-type conductor and it moves electrons. So we have no minority carriers involved in the photocarrier conversion step. That's very important. We we'll see later that with the PN junction, you always have to worry about the minority carrier lifetime. Here we have only majority carriers, the electrons being injected in an n-type oxide, moving away, being collected, and we finally they do something useful, some work in the external circuit, and then uh, we have to get the electrons back from where they come, because the sensitizer has lost that electron, so we need to feed it back to the sensitizer, and that is done by a redox shuttle. So in the iodide triiodide, the electron would be picked up by triiodide, it would be, it would be turned into iodide and then the electron donation would recycle, from iodide would recycle the sensitizer. So you need a shuttle that moves the electron, the redox shuttle, or a hole conductor that moves positive charges from left to right. You can express it either way. How many cycles? Well, the, uh, under 20 years outdoor, the sensitizer to go through 100 million cycles, and uh, so we need to set some kinetic criteria for stability. This brand simply means that we need a branching ratio at this first instance of 10 to the 8 in favor of injection. So we have a bleeding channel, say K1 is a bleeding channel out of the excited state. Well, this injection, which is the productive channel, has to be 10 to 8 times faster than bleeding channel. There's no problem to meet that. You can get 10 to the 10 or even 10 to the 12 because the injection is so fast. Then comes this step. Where again, we, have, we may have a bleeding channel out of the oxidized dye. It's, uh, it's, if you have an organic cation radical that could lose a proton, for example, that would be a bad thing to happen. Okay. So uh, you have to check by electrochemical testing whether the oxidized state lives for about one hour. If it does, then you're safe. At least one hour lifetime for the S plus state. Because the regeneration is in the microsecond range, and so again, we need about 10 to the power of eight in favor of the productive step. And so we know, if we look at new sensitizers, we, we know what to, what, how to judge those sensitizers in terms of photophysical and electrochemical behavior. We also, people have done long-term experiments, some, some of them lasting for under full sunlight or even 2.5 times the full sunlight for many thousand hours. The longest experiment I, uh, lasted, for, lasted for four years, four years uh, full sunlight on a cell. It was done by a ja Japanese company that wanted to absolutely check whether these dyes would go through these many turnovers. So, so we have a good chance to get something stable. We design the dye properly, the electrolyte properly. And so let's just resume now. So we have uh, here the system that uncouples the light absorption and charge carrier transport. The dye is absorbing light generating electrons and positive charges. And they are transported by different materials and uh, the recombination of those charges has to happen across the interface. So it's very important. Charges move in different materials, and so that gives you a chance to control the recombination across the interface. And as I said to you, in the PN junction devices, you have that accumulation of TARS, very high purity required for solar grade silicon, 99.9999. Six nines it makes uh, things pretty expensive to make those uh, uh, materials, and so uh, that's why the price is still very high. 
But if I go back and uh, the, the, uh, the uh, this, uh, cell that would have this, the sign couldn't work because the, the light would go right through the monolayer and, and would not be absorbed due to the fact that the geometric cross-section of the die, in other words, the area it occupies at the interface, is much bigger than its optical cross-section, hundreds of times bigger. So we would need to stack hundreds of dye molecules to, to capture the light. But here we have only a monolayer. So that, that doesn't work well. And to, to convince you, if I put a monolayer of a dye on a single crystal oxide, I get a dismal performance here. It's uh, only a fraction of a percent, 0.13 percent of the incoming photons. At the, that's the optimal. It's a 400, uh, around 500 nanometer where we have the absorption maximum of the dye. Only a very tiny fraction is converted to electric current. And so uh, one of the reasons for that is that there is not enough light absorption. But there are other reasons. You have to dope these materials, and there is some other interference from the doping. So it just doesn't work. This, this whole system has a curiosity, a scientific curiosity. And when I was uh, a young uh, student, I, I was taught by the people that were the, uh, the respected, uh, had the respect of their colleagues, that it was a waste of time to work on systems like that. Because simply you had this absorption problem and conduction problem. And even if you thought about having a rougher service, well, you would never be able to collect the electron because of the imperfections you introduce. Just think about this nanocrystalline film. Now we have all these nanoparticles. Well, yes, we can absorb the light now because uh, going through many nanoparticles, the light beam will be attenuated. But it was a big surprise to see that you can get you know, over 80% of your instant photons collected. The main surprise was the collection. You can get the current out of these films there's no electric field assisting the charge separation. And so that was, uh, that was the scientific discovery that was made uh, 19 years ago. And so I show you the, uh, the uh, film one more time. This is how the, this, non this nanocrystalline titanium film looks like. It's uh, completely, I mean, the, see the 101 facets of anatase is a, it's, it's like a disordered network. And it has a huge surface area. The surface area of a 10 micron thickness is, uh, is a thousand. So that, that means thousand, at least 1,000 times roughness factor. The real surface area is over 1,000 times higher than the projected surface area. And so the question then is, if you inject an electron from the dye in a particle like this, how does it make how can the electron make it through hundreds of particles to be collected without recombining with a positive charge? There's no field separating these two charge carriers. But um, let me remind you that the electron moves in the particles, but the holes of positive carriers, they don't move in the same material. They, they move in the uh, electrolyte or hole conductor material. You, you, you infiltrate into the pores. And so that gives you a, a possibility to control the interfacial recombination. And as a matter of fact, uh, we have later we have, uh, I'll show you an example where the electron lifetime is about uh, several seconds in those films. It takes several seconds before the electron recombines with the positive charge. It's amazing, amazingly long. In silicon, the electron hole <laughs> lifetime is a few microseconds. So, almost a million times longer lifetime, but the transport is also <laughs> slow, maybe a million times slower than in silicon. But at the end, the product of the fusion coefficient and lifetime is almost the same in those materials than in single crystal silicon. So what that tells you is if, if our transport time, if the carriers uh, say, are collected 100 times faster than their recombination, then you get a plus, 99 plus percent uh, collection efficiency. That's the only thing you have to worry about. This ratio, how fast do I collect my carriers? 
and how fast is the recombination or lifetime of those chi's. Don't worry about the diffusion lengths. There are endless discussions going on about how to define diffusion lengths, the wavelength dependence, and so Just don't worry about it. We have a very simple formula that comes out of simple competition kinetics. You have the electrons can either recombine or they can be collected. So you have a, a reaction that, that uh, is that is a two parts on competition and from simple competition kinetics the branching ratio gives you this formula. We had for some time I had a very intense discussion with our colleagues from physics and, and they said this is too simplistic this is not the correct formula you can use it and so I said show me the literature that I'm wrong or right show me give me a reasoning just uh, not enough to tell me, you have to. So I got a reference back, pages and pages, and at the end, this formula came out, the same <laughs> which I had. In two lines, I can derive it, or three lines just from a competition kinetics. So these folks had done all sorts of integrations and approximations, and finally get this back. So just take it <laughs> by face value. That's the way to calculate your collection efficiency. Unless you have good collection efficiency, you can get a, make a good cell, so this instant photon to con conversion efficiency will be determined by the light absorption. Well, we can do that with this rough film to get good light absorption. The charge carrier generation, which involves charge injection and dye regeneration, we need to generate those carriers in the two different phases. This has to happen with near unit efficiency. And then, the, very importantly, this uh, collection. And it was on this collection that people were extremely skeptical when we started with this uh, development, saying that it's not possible to collect the carriers. It will inevitably fail. <laughs> and that was wrong. So, so, so the initial observation of this uh, uh, sensitization effect was made already a long time ago. It was some kind of a curiosity driven experiment. We had titania colloids in solution and put the dye on. We did the laser experiment to show, and what we found was that already then, that on those colloidal particles, that the, the, the injection was much faster than the recombination. It was about a factor of 10 to the 9 times faster. It wasn't just a factor of two, it was nine powers of magnitude, nine orders of magnitude of faster the injection than a recombination. And so that convinces that we had a chance to collect those carriers because they lived for a significant amount of time in those colloidal particles before recombining. So the first uh, <coughs> cell was built and uh, it looked uh, very primitive. You have this uh, electrode and the platinum gauze counter electrode. And, and here we have a voltmeter showing that we had a photovoltage of one volt. So that was in 1988. And then finally we used the nanoparticles we had been testing in the, in the solution phase uh, to make films. And I should give credit to Brian O'Regan and also to my student Andreas Kai. Andreas really came up with a method that to make those films in a very simple manner. He just he made it, those parts in a paste and doctor bladed the paste and heated the simple application he could make those films and they were just very reproducible. So we moved away from our fractals, the Swiss cheese type of uh, roughness and we were convinced that this was the way to go. And then the scale up has happened now. This is a, a module by 3G Solar in Jerusalem and uh, the production has now started, and, and we'll see the first building applications, building integrated panels. And so today we have, uh, we, we have reached on a single, single laboratory, so you have to be very careful with those efficiency figures. Uh, uh, some people quote only the laboratory cell efficiency. Well, let me tell you, we often people would make a thousand cells. And if you have enough time, enough money, you can make 10,000. <laughs> and then you pick one, the best, and you have it measured, and then that's just, there's nothing wrong with that. I just have to be careful when you see those values of 
so-called quote champion cells. So we can make routinely cells between 11.5 and 12 percent. This is what that means in clown. If I, if I want to say that uh, uh, clearly is that this 12 percent is, is a champion result, but the module efficiency is 9.5. That means there's not much loss. And these modules, this is not the champion model. These, these are now in, in produced industrially. And so by Sony, is this value is by Sony. And uh, so that means we really don't lose a lot on scale up. Here's some of, uh, lifetime figures and energy payback time. So for the rest of my talk, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the exciting stuff, new science. <laughs> so. And uh, let me, uh, I can't talk about all of this. It's uh, be way too long. And so I'll, I'll see how far I will get. But uh, start with the nanostructures. So amazingly, if you uh, think about these nanocrystalline films, uh, they, uh, you can do much better. And one way of collecting light more efficiently is, is to use those beads. Credit goes to Rachel Caruso from uh, University of Melbourne and Yibing Cheng from uh, Monash. And so two Australian colleagues, they came up with those beads. And uh, last year I was in Wuhan, China, and, uh, and Yibing showed us these results. Amazing. When you make those beads, they're very easy to make. You just have to the hydrothermal process with the uh, templating surfactant. And out come those balls, and then you burn the surfactant, and it, it introduces the mesoporosity. In other words, these beads have a, they're porous. They have 60% is actually a porous volume. And so they have a huge internal surface area. So if you put those balls in a dye solution, they will just pick up the dye, and they get charged. All the internal surface will be clad with the dye molecules. And now you hit those balls with a light. Out comes a surge of electric power. All the absorbed photons will be converted, all practically 100%. So, of course, you have to absorb the photons, not all the sunlight. That would be too good to be true. And so why? Well, the absorption has helped. First of all, these, these, these uh, balls or beads they uh, transport the electrons very well because they can heat them at higher temperatures so the necking is better between the particles that compose those beads. And they also scatter light so that at the end, the red light, which is weakly absorbed with a normal nanocrystalline film, gets contained and is, the optical path is enlarged by a scattering. And so we, we have recently published a paper on, of course, I... Uh, immediately ask <laughs> Yibing to give me some of those balls. And so he said, well, what do you give me in return? And so I offered him one of our near-infrared sensitizers. And we made a deal, and he and out comes this joint paper, <laughs> which, uh, which shows we can, with a simple application of those beads, we can get over 10%. So, but I, I, so surprises happen, and this is a very simple nano. It's a secondary nanostructure. The architecture, you have the nanoparticles, and you go to the beads, and then you make out of the beads, you make a film. So you have two levels of, of architecture. I think this, we'll see much more of that. We have, for example, here there's also a very interesting uh, Swedish company called Nanolab Solar is using uh, the uh, photonic bent gap effects to uh, scatter back the lights. So, so you have a normal nanocrystal film, so these will be transparent films, but at the end you have this triple layer, and that is a grading. It's a one-dimensional photonic band gap system. And so what that does for you, it's a, it's a low energy end. You get some uh, slowing down, they call it, of the photons, so it just get a better absorption of light in the, in the red, and and but what's the advantage compared to the beads? Well, they remain transparent. These films, you don't see these, <laughs> this structure. So you can make a window that has a photonic band gap part. 
and get in hot, pick up a photon. So, the dyes we have been using over the years, uh, these are, I showed you this structure, the black dye was a, 2001, the black dye was made, and, uh, and for a while it was the best dye. No doubt it had better light harvesting, and see we're picking up at 900, and it's going up slowly. We would like to have this go up more steeply, but anyway, this is what we get. And uh, over nine years, almost uh, a very little progress, or say over five years at least. What happened after was that uh, Professor Wu from uh, Taiwan, a tiny little lady, but she's a very, very clever person. Okay. She comes up with this idea to modify the uh, bipyridine with some light harvesting function. The thiophenes are just increasing. See, this big uh, uh, maximum here, that comes from the thiophenes. So the dye has now an additional huge peak, but not only, well, that wouldn't help us much, it's in the blue, but it also shifts the absorption. In the, so the, this transition uh, brought some intensity to the red transition. It's, you get a high extinction coefficient, a red shift. And so out come cells that uh, give 20 millivolts at close to 800 millivolts. So these are actually better cells than the black dye cells. The black dye cells, slightly better. The black dye will give you maybe 11.2%, this, uh, as I said, between 11.5 and 12. Black dye has a little bit higher corn, but uh, we don't get that good a voltage. And so it's very important to move to the red, and so a lot of people trying to just think about it. If we would absorb all the photons uh, up to 900, we should get close to 30 milliamps corn from the cell. I just showed you a cell of 20 milliamps per square centimeter. But a uh, very, very interesting breakthrough was reported at a Chinese conference and then also in Korea this summer by Professor Segawa. He has not uh, disclosed the structure of the dye. <laughs> it's a ruthenium complex. Uh, he told me, I saw him two weeks ago in Japan, but he didn't want, he, I think there must be some uh, IP issues. So. He, he, will find, he will definitely disclose. He will also send us some data for testing, he told us. So it's not something where you have to be suspicious that <laughs> somebody invents it. Tokyo, you know, Tokyo wouldn't do that, okay. So we have a tremendous uh, pickup here. It goes now to 900 nanometers. See, the green curve was the black dye. This was our red dye. So we're going now almost 200 nanometers in the red. This is really a breakthrough. I mean, if you look at the uh, at this uh, photocon generation curve, it's it's the same like in silicon photovoltaic cell. There's not much difference. So we have been uh, recently we have been seeing the ruthenium going up, but these organic dyes are also picking up. And so uh, let me briefly mention to you the very important uh, work on donor acceptor dyes. These. Uh, Dyes have a trirolamine usually, or the tetrathiophorbolin. That's a donor function, and you have a, a bridging part, acceptor. Acceptor is uh, very often the cyanoacrylate. It binds through the carboxylate and the cyanide to the titanium surface. So, so the dye is, is, is uh, self-assembled in a way where the acceptor is near the surface and the donor is away from the surface. That's good because at the end, after injection of electrons, you have the plus charge away that will prevent the recombination from happening rapidly. So all these things, uh, if you design your dye correctly, you can help the photovoltaic conversion a lot. But there's so many options, millions. If you just think about what you could use as donors and bridge and acceptors. So how do you? How, how do you pick the right trip, the right choice? And so we had made those four dyes, and uh, Professor Head Gordon, Martin Head Gordon from Berkeley, I was at that time in 19, uh, 2008, I was in Berkeley, and 
he offered to help us. He said, look, we, I have a student, uh, Caruso, David Caruso, and he could tackle that problem to help you with the design of those DPA sensitizers. And so I, also I said, OK, so I'll give you these four structures, and I won't tell you where the absorption maximum is. You calculate it first, and then you will cross-check. If you are within 0.1 EV of the measured solution spectrum, then I start to believe in your method. And so they did. <laughs> and we just published a paper with David Casanova, uh, the first theoretical paper I published in my whole life. And so it's, it shows that the, the configuration interaction singlet, that's the code that Martin developed, it's actually very powerful. I mean, if you look at B, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, DFT, it's just way off. In all fairness, I should say there are other uh, 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 DFT codes that, that can do better than this one, the B3LYP. It's just a standard. But if you use that code, you're way off. I mean, you're one electron volt off. But this code, very nicely. All four. So we became very convinced that actually the theoreticians can assist us in designing new DPI-A dyes. Here are some recent success stories. We have uh, Professor Peng Wang with the, the bridge thiophene. Believe me, if you compare the, the same dye without the bridge here, the two thiophenes will not be coplanar. And so by bringing them in coplanarity, you gain a factor of two in extinction coefficient, two times higher absorption coefficient. Just that simple chemical trick. And so not surprisingly, if you look at the absorption spectrum, here's our classical ruthenium dye. <coughs> this is the workhorse now for some practical applications. You see the red dots, well, you see those red dots are the, from the uh, the uh, deeper A dye, five times higher extinction coefficient. And so this has been, uh, we also have the homo lumo properly, the binding is okay. We have checked the injection and we find that the lifetime of the dye is very short, it's only 50 picoseconds. But if we put it on the surface, we get quantitative injection. Here's our S plus absorption see the reactions over within one picosecond. So it's a femtosecond process. So we don't need long lifetimes in those dyes. It's enough to have 50, fem uh, 50 picoseconds. You still get quantitative charge generation after light absorption. And so uh, let me just go quickly over. So we have used some of those sensitizers now in, uh, for example, the whole conductor cells. Uh, we work on solid state uh, dye sensitized cells where we no, do not use those uh, electrolytes anymore. And you see, with the, for the first time, we're getting uh, the IBC over 80% with these solid, solid state cells have challenges. The carrier lifetime is shorter, so you can only use two micron thick films. Usually, that's not enough to absorb the light. But with the high cross, uh, optical cross-section dyes, you can absorb the light. You can use much thinner films. Recently, there has been a breakthrough also with these dyes using uh, the cobalt, the shuttle that replaces iodide, triiodide. So these are cobalt complexes. I should tell you, the, the story was a very frustrating one for us. We started in 2001. <laughs> and uh, after long optimization, this, was, this complex was declared the winner. It's a bisbenzimidazole pyridine complex of cobalt. And, but it didn't work well at full sunlight. It, for, for low light level, fine, it's, but we never got it to work. On the full sunlight, it's too bulky, it moves slowly. It, it, it makes an iron pairing effect with a ruthenium sensitizer that has negative charge. So that whole thing just didn't work well at, at moderate light levels. And full sunlight, it was a disaster. The con was not linear. And so many other people <laughs> tried and came up with the same conclusion. But then 
just a few months ago, uh, Dr. Hockfeld from uh, Uppsala and Li Chen Son uh, from Dalian, they reported in a conference in Korea, that if, you have, if you use an organic dye, or one of those deep high A dyes, then all of a sudden things work out well, even at, at high uh, light levels, full sun is almost linear. See, the current is about 10 times higher at full sun. So this encouraged us to go back to our own uh, work on deep high A dyes and uh, Nok-Tsao, uh, Nok Dr. Nok-Tsao in Omai Kub, he just started, got right away 9.3%. It's amazing. And the uh, IPC is over 80%. So the efficiency is high despite of the fact that we use only two micron thick titanium layers. If you use the same layer with iodide electrolyte, the efficiency will be much lower. Why? Well, we get a much higher voltage with the cobalt. We get uh, close to 900 millivolts voltage. And you see the, these current transients just show that we're going from, uh, say, 1% sun to 10% to 100%. These are normalized, intensely normalized signals. So if they're all on one level, it shows you this is a strictly linear phenomenon. So there's no, uh, there's no loss in the current at full light level. And so this is uh, certainly a breakthrough and will open up many, many new options for uh, redox couples and dye sensitized solar cells. And the reason why we get a higher voltage is that we bring down the, the level, the Fermi level of the shuttle by 150 millivolts using cobalt. And so we're losing less driving force in the regeneration of the dye by this, uh, uh, by this redox couple. And so there, I've, I just wanted to, uh, to, uh, to, to mention that there's a, a final example of a, of a deep high A dye. It's the one we just published in Angwande. It has a zinc porphyrin as a bridging agent. And uh, Dr. Diao and Dr. Yi from Taiwan, they were the ones that proposed those dyes, published first. And we run them in our top-notch cells, and we got really amazing uh, response in the visible and 11% uh, cells. So this, uh, this whole field, it seems like we are having a, a momentum that will uh, produce new sensitizers, very powerful sensitizers that uh, will allow it to progress in the overall efficiencies very significantly. Why is that the sensitizer so good? Well, it's, if you look at the lifetime, we have done impedance measurements. If you look at the lifetime of the carrier and the transport time, remember what I said to you in the beginning. If you collect 100 times faster your charges than the recombination time, then you're okay. And so let's look at this the ratio of collection. Collection is the transport time, so it's our cell optimum potential. That's where the cell gives the maximum efficiency, 650 millivolts. Transport time is done here. Lifetime is about a second. So you see the two orders of magnitude. And that's, that's what you need to collect those charges. So what that tells you is the dye is really snugly cladding those nanoparticles. And uh, when, once the electron is injected, it has troubles getting out across the mon layer because the mon layers are blocking, electronically blocking. And this is somewhat idealized picture, but that's what but what you want to have really at the end is a compact monolayer which delivers charge in one direction but doesn't let the charge go back out once the, <laughs> the injection has happened. So that's the picture of fast injection or re regeneration in the nano to microsecond range. The transport interface recombination, that's critical for collection. And again, I've, I'm pu putting up this famous formula it's so simple, it's almost <laughs> uh, a shame to put it up all the time, but just to, to, to make you develop a feeling of what the cell should look like to get good collection efficiency. And so uh, actually I have to now, see my time is, uh, I want to very quickly t t talk to you about one more slide and then I show you some practical examples. 
And so recently we have been uh, studying uh, another injection cell that uses lead sulfate. I mean, it's a new kind of idea to use a quantum dot. Well, not new really. A lot of people have used quantum dots instead of sensitizers for injecting electrons. But here we use a quantum dot layer. We don't use a whole conductor anymore. And so lead sulfide is a very attractive material because it has a one microsecond lifetime. The electron whole lifetime is very long in those nanoparticles. And so uh, it also has <coughs> a very good transport. When I first thought about this experiment, I thought this is impossible to do because you never get the positive charges across. It's about a 100 nanometer thick film of lead sulfide particles. And so I discouraged actually my coworkers to even try that. But I was wrong because it's, uh, it's, it's now known that you can really uh, get good transport. And, and with uh, Ed, Ted Sargent, or Ed Sargent, we just published a paper where currents of between 15 and 20 milliamps per square centimeter have been drawn. The efficiencies are not all that good, they're about 5%, but it's amazing that you can get these high currents just from a simple, simple junction of. A, these are larger particles of Ti2, and they accept electrons and the lead sulfide. And so that also gives us a, a red response in the photo uh, current action spectrum. And we are dreaming about having red response. And so these quantums are interesting because they give you a, a response way into the infrared, and that's very important for making efficient tandem cells. And also, we just heard from a paper by Parkinson. It seems, as now, this is now some debate going on. I just show you the paper, the science paper. It seems like you can get some of the multi axons that are formed or are postulated to be formed in those uh, lead sulfide particles. You can collect those and get absorb photon to conversion efficiencies of over 100%. Well, this is. Uh, for the science, and now I'm uh, showing you some, uh, just to relax you for the last five minutes. <laughs> no more science. <laughs> can turn your brain off, just uh, enjoy these beautiful colors. <laughs> and so, uh, and also the beautiful lady, of course. And so uh, this is uh, a Japanese, uh, um, a lot of work going on in Asia, in, in this area in Korea, in Taiwan, in China, Asia, in Japan. And so here we have some modules from Aisin Seki. You see the Korean Daiso Timo is uh, developing those panels. They are, they are they're very nice uh, colors. Now, what, what can you do with those panels? Well, you could put, make a wall and uh, would people like a wall like this? Well. I have to tell you, I was recently contacted by the, an architect who is rebuilding Roland Gall Gallos. I don't know whether you know, this is the famous tennis court in Paris. And uh, they are thinking of putting these glass walls up and want to have Dyson style cells for the glass walls. So when I showed him that, he really got turned on. He, he said, well, <laughs> I want nothing else. I want this and I want you to put me in touch with the folks that can make those panels. And so, uh, so there are clients, and this is now the Sony equivalent. We have those Sony lamps that are capturing uh, ambient light and, uh, during the day, and they just store the electric power at batteries. And then during night, you get uh, the light back from uh, LEDs. So these lamps never have to be plugged in an electric power supply. That's the good thing about it. You save a lot of electricity. You don't have to put power lines. can help in, in countries, poor countries. Of course, they might be happy with less funds hit pictures. But anyway, it's, it's a very nice uh, device. These are also charging devices. Look at this, a very practical. It's a Korean. <laughs> it's a Korean invention. It's, these are street lamps where you also during the day you collect the light and then during the night the LEDs brings it back out. I showed you already those building integrated. 
These are some roof applications in Nagoya. So what would that be? Well, very useful. Very useful. <laughs> uh, so we saw this. It will choose. See these modules, three, three amps current and 20 volts. I mean, this is really, we think well, when we started, you remember that beaker that produced a few, a fraction of a milliamp. <laughs> and so, uh, so here we have really some power coming out. And uh, electric cars will come, will be developed soon. And so having panels that would charge up car batteries integrated in buildings is certainly an important application. We have seen also very good stability results. These are now the electrolytes are, are ionic liquids that are solidified by addition of silicon nanoparticles. You have an ionic liquid, put 5% silicon nanoparticles in weight, you will get a solid that you can, can cut through with a knife. We had actually a report on this several years ago. And uh, now we have those panels from Fujikura that use that concept and very stable. You get 8% conversion on a panel level, very stable, 85%, 85 humidity, 1,000 hours. So this is hell. I mean, to put yeah, a cell under a condition like that, it's really a, a tough test. 85 degree, 85 humidity. This is a light test and a heat cycle. This is also a very tough test. And as I said, these ionic liquids, they made into solids um, very easily and you can cut through them. So also these, uh, these flexible cells are using ionic liquids that were made by G24 Innovation. You can get all sorts of, uh, I, I bought one of those rucksacks and I liked it so much so I thought we should offer one to our president. Our president is Doris Leuthardt here, the lady on the right. And this gentleman is the German president. Christian Wolf, and he just, uh, they just were on a state visit, so they came by, uh, you know what uh, G24 prepared, the, these are keyboards with the Swiss flag colors and the dye-sensitized solar cells powering the keyboard. And you have the, the German colors, or Belgian colors, almost Belgian colors, uh, and so, uh, you have, uh, so they were very happy with that. And then they were even more happy when we offered those rucksacks and uh, <laughs> backpacks. The German president looked a little bit skeptical. But his, <laughs> but his wife, his wife was, uh, was of course, Doris Leuthard, our president, she knows what to do. She put it on her back right away and walked off with it. So this is, <laughs> so, so this is the car idea. Of, uh, and flexible cells. And uh, this, uh, of course, it, it's, you wouldn't drive a car like that, I don't think so. <laughs> it's, it looks odd, but it did make the sevens. Came out uh, number seven in 35 contenders. I think the charging electric cars is really an important or hybrid cars, and we will see a lot of opportunities there for organic photovoltaics. And so finally, I, let me. Let me finish by uh, showing you that it's very important to get the young people. Here lots. I'm so happy that you all came to my lecture. I want to thank you for your interest. And I want to point out how important it is to motivate young generation. So uh, this is uh, a Tsinghua uh, graduate student. She had made herself this panel. Was very happy. <laughs> it worked actually very well. And so. But we are showing the uh, young students from the high school. We use those uh, blackberries. <coughs> they have the undersigning dyes, and with the chelating groups, they just just squash them and put the TI2 film on just in the pulp, and it will pull the dye off and make you a photovoltaic device that can power radio. And so the students are delighted. So we have even shown this to younger persons. And, and this is uh, the youngest generation. Getting infatuated is very important. So motivate people, make them passionate about research and science. I don't think I have to, to I think uh, you're all motivated and passionate. I uh, thank you for your attention and for coming to my lecture.